So our next speaker uh, worked on a project that probably many of you, and he's going to talk about it, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But our next speaker worked on a project that, for those of us who are old enough to have grown up with, uh, with major sort of later generation diseases like HIV, um, was an incredible burst of optimism in a fairly slow moving uh, scientific community. Um, and when last year, uh, the players of a game called Fold It uh, successfully uncovered an important protein in the fight against HIV. And I remember seeing that, and of course, having heard about Fold It and seen it in its early days, and thinking, God, isn't this an incredible moment for us when games and gamers are not only um, potentially changing the world, right? But gamification is actually leading to direct scientific discovery. And so it's um, very, very exciting to have one of the preeminent experts on how we use gamification to solve really super hard problems. It's my pleasure to welcome up to the stage Seth Cooper from University of Washington. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about um, video games and science, and in particular, video games kind of being part of the future of science and the key to solving scientific problems that might otherwise go unsolved um, in the future. And this is because video games are really great at, at focusing people on solving difficult problems that are in the game. So what if we could use that, that focus and that problem-solving power basically to solve problems in the real world rather than problems that have been made up for the game? And so I think that if that were the case, then we'd be able to use games as a means to combine the power of people's minds and brain power with the raw computational resources that computers are able to give us and basically be able to solve problems that would have been unsolvable without bringing these two pieces together. And there's one scientific domain in particular where games have started to show some of their potential. And this is in biochemistry and in particular proteins and protein folding. So why are we interested in proteins at all? Well, proteins are kind of like the workers in the factory of the cell. And everything from fighting against disease to muscle movement to digestion to even thoughts and things like that have some role played in them by proteins. And so understanding them can actually help us to develop things like new vaccines, uh, kind of uh, environmentally friendly plastics, and even new fuels and biofuels that are more efficient and that kind of thing. Um, so you can imagine how interested scientists are in basically learning more about proteins. So how do scientists go about understanding proteins? It turns out it's actually really, really difficult. Uh, when, a pro when a scientist wants to understand a protein, what they really want to know is what shape does the protein take? What's its 3D structure? Where are all the, the little atoms in the protein going to actually be when it's floating around in the cell? And this is because the, the structure and the shape of the protein actually determines its function and how it's going to interact with everything else in the cell and actually fight against disease or help you move your muscles and that kind of thing. Um, and, and the protein takes this shape through a process called folding. And you may have heard of protein folding. But because proteins are so small, it's actually impossible to determine their shape with something like an ordinary microscope. You actually have to have, if you want to determine the shape experimentally, a lot more specialized equipment, uh, specialized procedures that can take a lot of time, a lot of money, require a lot of specialized training and lab technicians. And in the end, after you've put all that into determining the shape of a protein, it might not actually work. It might not actually come out that you can determine it with the methods that you're using. Uh, so lab experiments in determining the shapes of proteins that way has been very difficult. So naturally, scientists have tried to turn to computers to actually try to maybe be able to compute the shape of proteins. If we can throw like, all the computational power that we have at them, right, then maybe we can actually compute the shape for a particular protein. And so if you're familiar with the SETI at Home project where you know, when you're not using your computer, a screensaver comes up and it donates you know, your extra spare computing time to, to searching the stars for, for signals from extraterrestrials, scientists have taken a similar approach to trying to compute the shape of proteins. Uh, and so they're distributed computing projects like Folding at Home and Rosetta at Home that follow this similar volunteer computing model. Uh, except instead of looking through the stars for alien life, um, they're searching for protein shapes. And so the way that the Rosetta at Home project works is actually it takes a potential protein shape, makes some random change to it, and then compares that to the previous one, sees if it got better or worse. And if it got better, then it you know, 
picks up from that one and, and continues making random changes. If it got worse, it goes back to where it was before. And so it's essentially trying to, to randomly and very, very quickly search through a lot of protein shapes. But even for very small proteins, the number of shapes that they could take is more than the number of stars in the known universe. So it's actually a lot more uh, shapes than you know, even a vast network of computers that we have is able to search through. But the interesting thing is you can actually watch the screensaver and you can see the protein shapes as the computer is kind of randomly searching through them. And as you look, you might say, hey, you know, why, why is the computer trying these particular moves? These pieces of the protein look like they fit together. You know, I, think, I think I could do better than the computer sort of random search is doing. And this is because the proteins are a lot like 3D jigsaw puzzles. And all the little pieces of the protein need to fit together in just the right way for it to take on the correct shape that it takes in nature. And in just the same way that a person can kind of look at the piece of a jigsaw puzzle and know if that's the right piece to put down in, in the empty spot on the puzzle before they actually do it, uh, we hoped that people would be able to look at proteins and figure out how the pieces fit together in a way that computers just aren't able to. And so we asked ourselves, what if we gave the, the users the power to actually interact with the proteins and manipulate them rather than just watch the computer kind of search? And so this inspired us to make the game Fold It. And here, here's a little video of, of some of the gameplay. And this is developed at the University of Washington as a collaboration between the Center for Game Science and the Baker Biochemistry Laboratory there. And it's designed to take a new approach by engaging the players and actually manipulating directly and folding the proteins by uh, giving them the tools to sort of pull on parts of it and rearrange it at a high level. And then they can actually let the computer take over and do some automated moves and try to figure out exactly where each atom is supposed to go. And in this way, they basically each get to do what they're best at. The humans get to do the high level spatial reasoning and fitting of the pieces together. And the computer can do the number crunching to figure out exactly where all the pieces go in the end. And as the players manipulate the protein, they're basically getting a score, which you might be able to see at the very top of the screen there. And we're using um, an energy function from the biochemists that basically gives you a better score if your protein is better folded. So as the players interact, they're always getting feedback on how well folded the protein that they're working on is and how well they're doing. And then there's a leaderboard that compares them to everyone else who's working on that protein in the world. And so we have weekly protein folding competitions where the players are all competing to try to find the highest score and therefore the best folded protein. So who's, we made the game and we put it out, so who, who ended up playing it? Well, we did kind of an informal survey of some of our users on the website. And of the people who responded, we found that you know, um, it's, mostly, it's mostly men, but there are some women playing the game. There's actually a wide variety of occupations represented. Uh, a lot of students and, and um, technology professionals, but also artists and things like that as well. And one of the really interesting things we found is that the community actually sort of sprung up worldwide. Out of all the players who, who responded, only about a third of them were actually in the US. And there are a lot of people in the UK and Europe and other countries around the world. And actually, one of the even more surprising things that we found was when we asked them what their background was with respect to biochemistry, uh, you know, fully three quarters of them basically had no real professional experience in biochemistry at all. And this, this was actually a survey of the top players that we did. And so basically, the players who are doing really well and in fact beating some of the professional biochemists have no previous background in biochemistry. So how do we actually teach them how to, to do well and how to fold proteins? Well, we took another idea from games, which is to have a series of introductory levels that basically teach you the principles of well-folded proteins and the tools of the game and what to look for and what kinds of things to change. There are context-sensitive hints, and uh, they sort of guide you through if you get stuck. And they start out, this is a very simple introductory level and they get more complicated. And when you do well and you get a good score on the introductory level, of course, you get lots of positive feedback with stars and sounds and that kind of thing. And we, so we did another survey where we asked the players what was their motivation for playing the game. And we sort of broke it down into a couple of different uh, responses. But by far, the most common response from the players about why they were playing the game was kind of the sense of purpose that they got and the fact that they were doing something that might end up helping science and you know, might contribute to, to fighting against disease or, or furthering our understanding of life. Um, and we actually made a, had a trophy made for one of our top players at one point that we gave to him. And uh, he was really excited. You could, he did very well on a puzzle. And we made a, a, a trophy of his, of his structure that he, he made. And he actually says that now he keeps it on his desk so that when his coworkers ask him why he's not playing Farmville with him, he can say, you know, he's helping to advance science and help fight against disease. So this, I think that this, this sort of sense of purpose that people get from participating in the project is really important. 
So once we had made the game, we wanted to actually see if it, if it worked and if, if you know, what, what humans could do and what, what could computers do and how did they compare. So we set up a test, basically, where we let the humans and the computers both fold a set of proteins and see who could get better, who could get closer to the right answer. And what we found was that in particular cases where a particular kind of structural rearrangement was involved, the humans actually were able to outperform the computers in most of the cases. And where the computer would actually get stuck and wouldn't be able to find the right kind of move, humans were actually able to kind of see how the pieces could fit together and, and persist with their ideas to move past the places where the computers would get stuck and find a better answer. So encouraged by that, we wanted to try out the game on a real, uh, a real open scientific problem. And so this is a rhesus monkey. And the Mason Pfizer monkey virus retroviral protease is a key protein that leads to AIDS in rhesus monkeys. And so we actually gave the, um, the structure of this particular protein that both the experimental biochemist and the computational biochemist that we've been working with, um, they had been working on it for, for a long time. The experimentalists had been working on it for uh, well over 10 years. We gave it to the players in the game. And in under three weeks, they were actually able to come up with the right answer and the right structure and solve for the structure of this protein related to this disease. And so we were all really, really excited about this. The, uh, the experimentals we were working with actually um, were in Poland, and so we had you know, a Skype champagne bottle opening because they were very excited. It's something they had been working on for 10 years. Finally, you know, they got to see the, the end of that and see, see the results. Um, which, so it was a really great kind of um, results that came out of that. We're actually not stopping there because the whole game itself is designed as a continuous experiment between the players, the scientists who are looking at the kinds of results that they're producing, and the developers and designers who are actually making the game and modifying the game. So there's this continual cycle between the players who are producing scientific results, the scientists who are analyzing them, and then the game designers and developers who can then take that and feed that back into the game to try and make the game better and better and better. And since then, we've actually seen that the players are able to do a lot of other really amazing things. So in addition to being able to solve for the structures of proteins that, that the scientists themselves weren't able to solve, we've actually given the players the ability to, to essentially write protein folding algorithms in the game. We call them recipes, and they can, they can write them and share them online. And we've actually seen that the players are able to independently discover the same kinds of sort of cutting edge algorithmic moves that can actually go back and make the computer algorithms better based on what the players have learned and figured out. And one of the most exciting things I think that's happened recently is that the players are actually able to design an entirely new synthetic protein uh, that, that's an enzyme and that is actually able to catalyze the reaction that the scientists were interested in about 20 times more efficiently than the enzyme that the scientists themselves had started with. So we're basically given, we have the players who are playing the game and we've given them the ability to, to write these algorithms and actually make the game better and, and make computational algorithms better by learning from the strategies that these players all around the world are figuring out. And the, the cool thing is we're able to take the designs and the proteins that the players make in the game and effectively synthesize them and bring them out of the game and into reality and see if they actually work. And so we've actually seen in some cases that they, they do in the case of that enzyme. And so we're actually looking at, at um, you know, impact in areas like health, uh, with ways to fight disease, new kinds of biomaterials, and, and ways to, to more efficiently use and store energy based on proteins that the players can design. But I think that these kinds of results that we're starting to see from Foldit are not going to be the exception to the rule in the future, but that actually games and, um, and video games and, and science working together are something that we're going to be seeing a lot more of in the future. And there are a couple of different things that I think are going to come out of this because play itself is changing and becoming more closely linked with science and scientific discovery. One of the key things that I think is going to be really important and we're going to see a lot coming out of is the sense of scale, right? So Folded has actually had 200,000 people play it up to this point, but Angry Birds has had, you know, 500 million downloads and Facebook is, is on its way to having a billion people who are, who are participating in it, a billion accounts. And so, the question is, what's going to happen if we could take all of this time spent playing games and, and, and being on Facebook and actually channel that into the, the solution of difficult scientific problems? And I think we can see, a, we'll start to see a lot of different kinds of games appearing for different kinds of problems, not just, you know, protein folding, but lots of different areas of science as well. 
Another thing that I think will be really interesting to see is a change in the structures of scientific problem solving and discovery. In a sense, the, the Folded community has, has emerged as kind of a worldwide research lab that's focused on solving these difficult scientific problems. And in fact, they're being solved by people who might not have otherwise had any opportunity to even know that they had this ability to, to fold proteins and to design proteins and to get involved in science. And one thing that I think is really exciting about that, that we might see in the future is the ability for, for people to not just play the games and participate in the games, but actually to be able to create their own games and actually as, as things get easier and easier to make, as we've seen like with video and writing and, uh, and images, you know, it's, it's getting easier and easier to not just consume these kind of media, but actually for people to create them and create things that, that are important to them and that relate to them and share those with, with the people in their lives. I think that we'll start to see this with games as well. And as games get easier and easier to make, people will be able to make these kinds of, hopefully, scientific discovery games that are relevant to the problems and challenges in their lives. So in that, in that sort of idea of seeing more games for science, kind of the three critical things that, that we were looking for when we started Unfolded and that we're looking for as we look for other games is first trying to find a problem that's essentially computationally unsolvable and that it won't be solved by just throwing more computers at it. Because if that were the case, then probably we could just throw more computers at it and we wouldn't necessarily need to, to have the game elements to get people involved. Second, it will be some kind of problem that leverages a human ability to be able to solve it. And in the case of Foldit, this is really the spatial reasoning and the fact that proteins are all about uh, how the pieces fit together and so people can look at them and think about the pieces and, and, and see the problem in a way that compu computationally we just aren't able to do with computers. And finally, some kind of problem that has a purpose. As, as we saw before from some of the surveys that we do with the players, a lot of the motivation is coming out of the sense of contributing to, to science and contributing to, to a greater whole and being part of something important like that. So I think that you know, games and science together and, and coming out of Folded and what's grown out of Folded and what we're going to see in the future, it's kind of like a whole new perspective that we can take and looking at games in a new way as a way to solve these hard problems and hopefully be able to, to benefit um, humanity in the future through this combination of games and science. Thanks. Great. So we have a few minutes for questions uh, from Seth, but of course I have some. So if you'd like to ask some questions, feel free to come down. Um, so my first, my first question to you is, so you point out 200,000 people play, have played Fold It mm -hmm. and 500 million people have played Angry Birds. What's going to get you, what's going to get us over the hump um, because, you know, to be honest, you look at Folded and you go, well, that's cool, right, right? right? But Angry Birds is more fun, easier to get into, and so on and so forth. So what, what do we need to do to get more people to, um, to engage with harder problems? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of what you said is true, but because uh, the protein folding, it's a very hard problem, and we tried to make it as intuitive and able to, you know, get right into it as possible, but, you know, it's still a very challenging problem and a very challenging game. So I think you know there may be other problems that that might be more amenable to to you know being having fun game rules and mechanics built around them in a way that they might catch on a little bit more. Folded is itself uh, you know it's available on all the PC platforms, but you know it's it's a download desktop install kind of game. Right. And so as, as we just saw, I think if we can get into sort of the mobile space, right, there's a lot more people that can be reached. So there were quite a few years of work in Folded before we got to this yes, particular right. iteration. So what, were there any like big kind of lessons that you learned that kind of, when you started to sort of pivot, like, you know, you sort of popped, you got that hockey stick of usage? Was there right. a particular kind of thing um, that drove that? <laughs> Most of the spikes that we see in uses, usage usually come from sort of press releases and that kind of thing whenever we show up in the news or something somewhere so that we see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that we did change uh, early on that we think was good and it actually came from the players, we actually have like a pretty active community and we get a lot of feedback from them, is when we started we just had one big giant leaderboard that had everybody on it. And uh, we, we actually we sort of split that apart into two leaderboards based on whether you were working by yourself or whether you were um, actually taking <laughs> structures from other people and being able to improve them. 
And I think that, that, was, that was a good change in the community, really like that. And we've actually taken that a little bit further recently into actually sort of categorizing the different types of problems that you're working on and, and ranking you within those. Oh, so cool. I think letting, letting people have more ways to win and, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of stuff on Facebook with this too, where you're just competing against your friends. You know, you're not, you know, number eighty thousand of you know a hundred thousand people on the leaderboard. Right. Okay. Take this question. Yeah. Um, it's a simple one. I'm just wondering if you know of any other, I guess, scientific endeavors that a game is being prototyped for, in the works for. Like, what uh, else is this in the memo to? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple. So there's actually one that recently had a paper come out called Philo. And this is a game where you're doing genetic sequence alignment. And um, so you get like the genomes of a bunch of different animals and you, you try to align them to try to sort of help figure out how they changed evolutionarily. And there's also one called Eterna that does RNA and you can sort of make these 2D shapes out of RNA. And uh, then they can make those in the lab and see if they actually, you know, kind of the RNA actually folds up in a similar way, analogous to proteins, and see if that it, it folds up in the way that you kind of predicted. Um, and we're actually starting to look into games for, for um, making nano devices out of DNA and that kind of thing as well. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Steph. Really appreciate it. Thanks. So, folks, um, we have our lunch break now.